We want to welcome all of our audience right now. They're signing on around the world. Thank you for listening to our broadcast today. And we pray God's blessing across the land, across the oceans, and the other countries that you will receive Jesus and spiritual help for your life today. Again, thank you for tuning in. So today I'm in Matthew chapter number 7. I want to begin reading with verse number 13, please. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware. Be cautious. Be enlightened. Keep your eyes open. Because of false prophets which shall come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are raving wolves. Thank you. That'll be all my scripture. I wish today, as every Sunday, I could speak to you like Jude in the book of Jude just prior to the book of Revelation. It is there that Jude wrote to the New Testament believers, and said, I wanted to write to you about a common salvation. But because of the dark day that we are living in, he was compelled to deal with the false prophets and the apostasy of his day. Every time I enter this pulpit, I want to make much of Jesus. But due to the days that we are living in, there are times... Sadly, that we must invest time and energy into exposure. I want to preach this morning on the subject, the importance of staying in the proper lane. Our text reveals the size, the direction, and the destination of two different roads, highways, trails, or what we would call lanes. The fact that one is noted for being wide is evidence that the vast multitudes are occupying the lane that leads to destruction. That's what the Bible says. Now, one thing I want to bring out because it will become important later on in the message, we must understand this, Brother Abbott. The reason why most people are on the broad road, wide and windy, that's leading to destruction In the context of the scripture, in verse 15, it's because of false prophets, lying preachers, and wolves in sheep's clothing. People are being misled and misguided by so-called spiritual leadership. Never has there been a day of more chaos and confusion in the religious world than the day we're living in today. You turn on the radio, the television, the internet, every kind of faint, dangled, weird, freaky idiot you could ever imagine is now in a pulpit somewhere declaring the word of God, or so they say. So I must, as your pastor, warn you that there is a lane, there is a way that this church has chosen, and we dare not deviate from that which leads to life. There's three reasons why the narrow way is offended to the human population. It's offensive to them for three reasons. Number one, it's straight. Isn't it amazing? Jesus said, out of everything I can tell you about the road to get you to heaven, it's straight. Nobody wants anything straight about anything anymore. If there was such a thing as a straight politician, and there's not, they would hang him in Washington, D.C. before the sun went down today because nobody wants a straight politician anymore. Nobody wants straight parents anymore that correct their children and tell them no and don't repeat themselves and don't give them time out and don't put them on redland because they can't get them to sit down when they're out in public. Nobody wants straight parents anymore. They want parents that are their buddies, their friends, their pals, Uh, their co-workers they want to be on the same level with their kids if you try that as a parent you're not only going to mess your life up you're going to mess your kids life up because at a very young age they need to know responsibility obligation 
and consequences from the voice of authority. If they will not respect the voice of their parents that they can see when they get older, they'll never respect the voice of God that they cannot see. So this road is offensive because it's straight. Second of all, it's offensive to the human population because it's narrow. Notice Jesus said it's narrow. Somebody said, how wide is it? It's that wide right there. You see that Bible? That's how wide it is right there. You know why Jesus said it's narrow? Because once you get on it, he never wants you turning back from it. The third thing that makes it offensive to the human population is it's the only road that leads to life. See, religion would have you to believe now that there's all kinds of roads that lead to heaven. There's all kinds of religions. There's all kinds of belief. And that as long as you're sincere, we'll all wind up at the same place. The problem with that is biblically, sincerity will never get you to heaven. Being sincere about what you believe or your religion will never get you to heaven. There is only one road that leads to life everlasting. It's straight and it's narrow. And Jesus clarifies later on, just exactly what that road is. Because I've told you, Jesus is not a way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. And you try any other road, you're going to wind up in destruction. You may go with the multitudes. You may have a big church. You may have a big crowd. You may have a lot of money. But you'll die and go to hell if you don't get on the Jesus road. And you know I'm telling it right. Over 47 years of being saved, I've seen many people change lanes. But it never turns out for the better. You remember it was the young snotty punk called the prodigal son that decided he wanted to jump lanes. It was then that his father divided his inheritance to him and he left and went into a far country. And the Bible said, wasted his substance on riotous living. Later on, his older son clarified that it was, it was women and immorality and drinking and partying. He lost everything. And I don't know how long, Brother Ethan, he stayed gone. I don't know how long it was. But because he decided to jump lanes, it brought division among the family. And think about all the nights that daddy went to bed wondering where his boy was, how he was doing. Did he have a place to sleep? Did he have food? Did he have clothes? What had he done with all of that money? Can you imagine the times the mother cooked supper and laid all the plates out at the supper table and there was that empty seat of that wayward boy? You see, when you jump lanes and you leave God, you cause division. Not only among the family of God, you cause division in your own family. When young people all of a sudden decide they don't want the Bible, they don't want to go to church, they don't want the things of God, and then you have parents say, well, I don't want to make them go to church. Now, wait a minute. If they're living under your roof and they're eating at your table and they're sleeping in your bed, you all have a right to say, you're going to church with me today, whether you like it or not, buddy. It's a funny thing to me. You make them brush their teeth when they didn't want to. You make them take a shower when they didn't want to. You made them go to school when they didn't want to. But when it comes to church, you leave it up to them. That is insanity. That will cause division down the road. Train up a child in the way that it should go, and when it's old, it will not depart from it. I say to you, when people switch lanes, when they jump lanes, it causes division among the family as well as among the church. In Ruth chapter number 2, it was Naomi that switched lanes. And it not only brought division, but it brought disgrace. Because ten years later, she goes back. Naomi means beautiful, pleasant, young, youthful. She was a beautiful woman to look upon. But after ten years of being out of God's will, and down in Moab and switching lanes on God, she comes back to where she left. And she had so changed in her countenance, that the people of Bethlehem, Judah, looked at her and said, Is this Naomi? Is this the same beautiful woman that skipped lanes on us? And she looked at them and said, Don't even call me Naomi anymore. Because the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. She said, Call me Myra. And the word Myra means bitter. And she said, The Lord has afflicted me. He has chastened me. And she said, I've left here full. And I'm coming home again empty. You see, when you switch lanes, it'll lead you down a road of disgrace. I've never seen anybody change on God and it come out for the better for them, for their life, their family, and their future. Say amen if I'm telling the truth. It'll bring you to a place of disgrace. It'll drag you down to nothing. It'll take everything from you God has ever blessed you with. And then sadly, later on, if you live long enough, you'll realize that you left the will of God with everything 
and now you're coming back with nothing. It was Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that changed lanes and brought discouragement among the great apostle Paul. Paul was in prison about to lose his head. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is the last chapter of the Bible that Paul ever writes. And he says to young Timothy, Demas hath forsaken me and has departed unto Thessalonica, having loved this present evil world. If Paul ever needed somebody to stand by him, encourage him, and be there to strengthen him and refresh him, it was now as he was about to die. But in that moment of need, one of his closest reliance left him, turned around, and went back to what he had come out of at one time. You see, when you jump lanes, you discourage other people. I have people have come to me down through the years and said, hey, I remember so-and-so that used to love God. Where are they at now? And I have to bow my head and say, well, they've switched lanes since you've seen them. They've gone another direction. And they've brought division into their life. And they've brought disgrace into their life. And you can see on those young converts' face that it's discouraging to them that the very people that funneled energy into them when they first got saved are no longer serving Jesus themselves. When I got saved, the first year and a half of my life as a Christian, I wrote the names of 10 preachers that helped me in the front of my Bible. It was my desire that in my lifetime, all 10 of those preachers would sign my Bible because of the influence they had on me when I was just a young Christian. After a year and a half of being saved and settling my Christian life and getting direction for my life, setting aside the business world, yielding my life to the ministry, I went off in the Bible college and did my undergrad work. My undergrad work took three years. Then I transferred and did my grad work, which took longer than that. But during that three-year undergrad work and that year and a half home, less than five years, when I looked in the front of my Bible after I graduated from that college and university, when I looked at the names of those ten preachers that were instrumental in encouraging me when I was a young Christian, seven of those ten were already out of the ministry. Gone. Busted homes. Drugs. Drunk. In prison. Seven out of ten men that helped me shipwrecked. And as a young Christian, if you're not careful, you can get so discouraged because people that seem to have life, have enjoyment, and have energy about them, all of a sudden you see them and they're going down a different road and seemingly going in a different direction. That's why Jesus said, Brother Joe, it's so important, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You'll never catch Jesus going down a different road. You'll never catch him switching lanes. People may let you down. People may discourage you. But he is forever faithful to his children and to his calling. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, it was Saul that crossed over and brought death. Saul at one time was called of God. When I read his life, it's almost unbelievably confusing how a man could start out so humble and have such anointing and the power of God on his life till at the end of his life he had so switched lanes and changed directions that the same young humble man that became the first king of Israel in all their history at the end of his life through a soothsayer and a voodoo woman was trying to pull up dead spirits of the people of God to communicate with them. It even got worse than that. Saul had gotten so far away and had so switched lanes and got in such a different direction, Brother Randy, that in 1 Samuel chapter 31, when his family and the Israelites were fighting the enemy and Saul seeing that him and his sons were surrounded by the enemy, the Bible said, he took out his sword, laid the handle on the ground, put it up against his bosom, and leaned forward. It's hard to believe that a man could one time be such a great spiritual leader and die such an awful death and leave such fallacy and ruin behind. But ladies and gentlemen, it will always be the desire of the devil to take your life, your family, and this church and to get us to go down another road. And that's why... And that's why I'm preaching on the subject today. We are, by the grace of God, going to stay in the proper lane. Who would 
could have dreamed that a man could follow Jesus for three and a half years. Seemingly have apostolic powers on him. He was so trusted as one of the apostles that they even made him the treasurer. When Jesus was in the upper room at the Last Supper, he said, one of you's a devil. And he was such a good pretender that all the disciples but John said, Lord, is it I? Judas had lived such a religious life that even those that he slept with and walked with and ate with and communicated with had no idea that he was on a different road the whole time. Because you see, when you change road, it'll not only bring discouragement and distress and, 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 and disgrace and death, but it brings damnation. Because the Bible said that Judas, after he betrayed the Lord, he cast the money down, ran out of the temple, went up to a high place in the book of Acts. The Bible said he hung himself. And his body hung. Nobody even took him down. And the Bible said his body hung there until his head rotted off his shoulders. And the Bible said his body fell down into the rocks and his guts burst out. But long before his head ever rotted off his shoulders, long before his guts ever splattered out of his rotted body, he was burning in the flames and the wrath of hell of Almighty God. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stay on the straight and narrow because it's the only way you have life. You can have your religion. You can have all your nonsense. You can have your soothsayers. You can have all your extra experiences. I'll take this blessed book and anchor my soul in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel that the Apostle Paul gave us. So, I want this church to know that as a church, as a leadership team, and as a pastor, we have put up every bumper guard, every, way, every rail, and every wall possible to assure that this ministry stays in the proper lane and stays balanced. The church purchased me a car to go visit. And it's a beautiful car. It's here today. I'll thank you for a ride. Five bucks a hit. We'll go around the block. <laughs> Got to make money somehow, right? So you know how it is when you get a new car. At least it's, it, it, it's how it is at our house. Let me rephrase that. You don't read the manual until something breaks. Why, why would you read a manual? Everything's working fine. The problem is you don't even know what equipment's on the car. My wife's owned hers for two or three years. She still gets the gear shift mixed up with the blinkers. That's the God's truth. We get in the car. We don't go in reverse. The, blink, the wipers start going. This is three years later. And I said, honey, did you know you have a manual? For what? So the church bought me this car, and it's got equipment on it, but I have no earthly idea what it is. It's got all these buttons on the steering wheel. It's got pictures. Uh, you know, we're stupid. You can't put words. You've got to put pictures now. People are dumb. So I don't know what all these thingamajigs are. I'm just a basic type guy. I don't need all that junk. So I'm going down the road one day driving the car. It's probably got 100, 200 miles on it. Brother Charles then picked it up for me. Matter of fact, brought it to my home. I'm going down the road and on my steering wheel, it's got a picture of a little steering wheel. I thought, huh, I've already got one of them. <laughs> I wonder what that steering wheel is. So I hit the button. That sucker took over. It took over driving. It took over driving. Now look, I've been in scary situations. I've been in the car with my wife before. I've been in scary situations. Somebody said, you ever let your wife drive? One time. I got saved three times that day, and I've never got back in the passenger seat again. When I hit that button, I'm not talking about lane assist. I'm not talking about, that's old school now. This car drives without me. And it is, it is implemented, built in. Now, don't tell me how it works, because I, I don't have the foggiest idea how this thing works. It'll turn a corner for you. If the car in front of you slows down, it slows down. If I'm at a red light and the car in front of me takes off, my car tells me, hey, buddy, the car in front of you just took off. Get going. My car tells me that. I've got a wife. I don't need all of this equipment in my car. <laughs> See, you're so hempecked, you won't even laugh, you sucker. It tells me when to take off from a red light. I've never been anything like it. So what I do now is I hit that button. 
And I go down the road, we're talking, fellowship, and drinking coffee. Let that sucker drive. I paid for it. I got a built-in taxi driver in my car. And you don't even have to tip him. You don't even have to tip him. And he knows English. <laughs> and that thing keeps me in the middle of the road. And it's called proper driving assistant. It's an assistant to me. And it keeps me from wavering out of the proper lane. It holds me to the true lane that I'm supposed to be in. You see, that's how God sets the church up. God puts the church on the straight and narrow, but then he gives us some driving assistance. God gives us certain things that keeps us in the lane that we should be in. And it's very, it's, it's very probable that I deal with this today because I'm seeing so many preachers lead churches off into detours. And taking churches into different lanes and going into dif different, different ministries and having different flavors and all kinds of different titles. And because of that as your pastor, it's a necessity that's laid upon me to remind you and myself, we're not changing lanes. We're not switching ministries. We're not changing Bibles. We're not giving up the gospel. We're not going with a new fangdangled mess. We are staying in the proper lane. Now, God has given us three things that assist us to stay the right way. Number one, I want to mention them. Number one, he gives us common sense. Huh, isn't that something of the past? Just common sense. Not allowing influence of others, fleshy emotions, or fables, which means stories, to guide our walk with God. We must have something much more dependable than that. We don't embrace these supernatural experiences on their merit alone. The low-down devil can give you all kinds of supernatural experiences if that's what you're going to anchor your salvation and your destiny in. Just because something seems real doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't matter who says it and how many people applaud. Just because it seemed real to them doesn't mean it's right. Let me illustrate. I was preaching one night in a church, and I could tell getting into the service very quickly that I was not really amongst friends. So I just decided this is a one-time thing. I'm going to lower the boom and get my wife and get out of here. So while I was preaching, I, I got done preaching, and uh, a woman preacher and her assistant came up on the platform. And that is, Now, the woman preacher was fine. She was very kind, very gracious, precious lady. But her assistant wound a different, wound on a different cord. So he comes up on the platform and he's just breathing fire. I mean, he's upset. He said, I'll tell you something. You can preach Jesus only all you want, but I know what happened to me. I know when I got saved and it wasn't Jesus alone. I said, all right, I'm bored anyway. How did you get saved? He said, I was in a meeting one night. We stood up for invitation. And I had a big wart right there on my baby finger. And when I stood up and lifted my hands, that wart fell off my finger. I said, okay. He said, that's how I know I got Jesus. A wart fell off my finger. A wart fell off your finger? He said, now what are you going to say to that big boy? I said, it must have been an anemic frog that wet on it because I'm going to tell you something, brother. You're not going to heaven because warts fall off your finger. You're not going to heaven because you grew another tooth. You're not going to heaven because one eye is now bigger than the other. If you ever make it inside the pearly gate, it'll be because you put faith and repentance in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, plus nothing and minus nothing. That is the only thing that will get you to heaven when you die. People just don't have common sense anymore. Now, I must deal with this because of the necessity that's laid upon me. There is a movement that has sprung up that came up back in the 80s when I was a young preacher. It's called the deliverance movement. Everything that's wrong with you is because you have a demon. If a hair's on your pillow, you got a demon. If you got indig I'm telling you, if you got indigestion, you got a demon. If you're constipated, you got a demon. If you got diarrhea, you got a demon. If your hair hurts, you got a demon. If the car won't start, it's not a bad battery. you got a demon. And everything's got demons in them now. There's never been a bigger false prophet movement in the history of America than this garbage that's going on right now known as deliverance movement. 
People get sucked up in it because of the entertainment value of it. Preachers get sucked up in it because of big crowds and a lot of money. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm making it very clear while I'm in this pulpit. There ain't no stinking deliverance preacher getting in this pulpit while I'm the pastor of Emmaus of Kingsport. I tell you that much right now. I'm going to tell you what delivered me. What some jack leg putting his hand on me. When I got washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, when I got born again, all the chains fell off of me and I have liberty in God. And I'm not being mean. I'm just making myself very clear. We're going to keep this church in the same lane and the fundamental biblical belief that it has always had. And if you're going that route, you probably need to find another church because the first time I find you trying to exercise it here, we're going to vote you out of here. I'm going to tell you something. I have dealt with people with demonic oppression, but that's not the ministry of this church. We have laid hands on people and God has healed them, but that's not the ministry of this church. The ministry and the calling of the church of the living God is to propagate the gospel and to tell everybody the good news that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And no matter where you've been and what you've done, you can be forgiven and released from your past and have a brand new beginning in the blood of Jesus Christ. By the way, some of you that are tilting this way, let me just say this very clear. Later on in this chapter, we're talking about the false prophets and the wolves in sheep's clothing. Let me show you one true identity of them in verse number 22. This crowd that are really wolves in sheep's clothing that's leading to a wide path out of the proper lane, here's what your Bible says. When those preachers that have done this stand before God, one of the things they're going to claim is, have we not cast out devils in thy name? You better watch this devil casting crowd. They may be dealing with themselves. They may need a little casting out themselves. You're not going to heaven because you can cast out a devil, nor are you going to heaven because you've got a devil cast out. You're going through the blood. I will always preach that it's the blood of Jesus Christ plus nothing and minus nothing. And that other filthy nonsense of false prophets and liars will never darken this pulpit as long as I'm the pastor here. Because I want to stay in the right lane. God gives us common sense. I'm, I'm closing. I'm out of time. And some of you look half ticked anyhow. He gives us the consistency of the scriptures. The only tangible foundation that we possess to anchor our soul in is the written word of God. Every section of our faith must be founded within the blessed pages of this book. Even then, there's a danger of twisting the scriptures and taking verses out of context from which they were intended to be delivered to the saints. The apostates of the last days are not Bible deniers. They're Bible distorters. An apostate is not only known by what they're saying, they're also known by what they're not saying. Anyone, anybody can make a Bible verse say anything if they choose to. But discerning the context in which it was said will help eliminate such folly and misguidance among the people of God. This is why the pastor, according to the book of Ephesians, must be apt to teach God's word. Because he not only must lead the people, he must feed the people of God. No testimony, no experience, and no drama, no matter how blunt, bold, and convincing, is to be held or supported if God's truth does not support it in the Bible. In our days of sensationalism, it has multiplied the droves of humanity in basing their eternal souls on that which is void of the Scripture. This is the main reason for all the new perversions of the Bible. It's in order to confuse, dilute, and mislead people. We are not bound here at Emmaus to a denomination. I'm not going to heaven or preaching out this Bible because I'm a Baptist. You can stick your denomination. Don't need your denomination. I don't want denomination. Denomination's man-made. It's never been a God, never shall be a God. When you get to heaven, there's not a Church of God side and a Church of Christ and a Baptist side and a Methodist side. I've never got into denominationalism. It never saved anybody. I don't give a flip about denomination. I want to know doctrine. I want to know biblical truth. I want to know what the Bible says about it. Am I preaching now? Who cares about a title? Shove your title. Don't need your title. I want truth. God gives us the consistency of the Scripture. I close. 
He gives us the convicting of the Spirit. The Spirit of God will never lead any of us to do anything that's not parallel with the Word of God. God's Spirit walks hand in hand with this Bible. The Holy Ghost is co-equal and co-important as the Word of God. They work together in perfect harmony. Am I right? You'll never get me or this church to believe anything that's in contrast with this Bible. You would be surprised in a year's time how many churches I go in and the pastor will stand up and say, the Holy Ghost told me this. And immediately a verse comes to me that contradicts what he is led to say. You better watch a man that's always led of the Holy Ghost, but it's contrary to the Bible. The Bible says try the spirits to see if they're of God. You better take a spirit in which somebody says something, you better open up this book and you better know it, or you can very easily switch lanes, be misled, and find yourself in a horrible, dark dilemma in your life, in your future, and in your eternity. The blessed Holy Ghost will lead us in all ways of truth. Quit blaming stuff on God that he had nothing to do with. The reason why preachers say the Holy Ghost told me to do this all the time, and I know God leads sometimes, is because they want to control and keep the people blind to the heresy they're trying to promote among the congregation. We are commanded to try the spirits we're going to. Let me give you this about my road assist and I'm done. My road assist does three things if I try to get out of the proper lane. The first thing it will do is there's a tug in my steering wheel. If I try to change lanes, my steering wheel, it, it tells me, me. I paid for this thing, but it's telling me, you ain't going that route. I feel a tug. Now I can't see the tug, I don't know really where it comes from. I can't put my finger on, hey, this is where the tug comes from. But I can feel a tug that I'm getting out of line. You know, if you're really saved, you have the Holy Ghost of God living in you. And when somebody comes with a foul message that is contrary to the Scriptures, the Holy Ghost will begin to tug on you and say, hey, something about him that ain't right. You better put a question mark on him. You better get away from that kind of ministry. You better get away from that sha -na, na You better get away from that supernatural. <laughs> you feel a tug. Now, if I, if I ignore the tug, I got an alarm. I think it'll go beep, 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 beep. The first time it goes off, you think the whole car is going to blow up. Because I don't know what all this stuff is. So if God tugs on you that you're trying to get, that seemingly you're drifting into a, somebody else's lane, then an alarm goes off. Something clicks in you. There's a, there's a sense of urgency that, hey, I'm not right. I'm not going the direction I'm supposed to go in. You're saved. You've bumped on God before. You've tried to get out before. You know what it's like to be out. And the whole time you're out, there's an alarm going off in you telling you, you need to get back in your right lane. I've also got in my car this stupid thing. It's a navigator. I got all these women talking to me in my car. Drives me nuts. It's never the voice of a man. It's always women telling you where to go. Do you ever notice that? Don't look at me like that. Just shut up and do what I'm telling you. Go home and put your GPS on. It'll be a woman every time. Turn left at the light. Turn right at the light. Makes me sick. I can't stop it. It's, it's built in my car. But if I put in I'm going to a destination, Brother Randy... And say I need to pull off to get gas. Or if my wife's with me, another bathroom. The moment I start getting off that ramp, not a quarter mile down the road, not a month later, the moment I start getting off that ramp, that GPS picks up on it. And you know what it says the moment I leave? Recalculating, recalculating. It never shuts up. The whole time I'm at the gas station, the whole time I'm pumping gas, the whole time she's in the bathroom, that stupid thing's yelling, recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. And the only way to get her to shut up is to get back on the road where I belong. You know what? When you start getting off at a lane where you're not supposed to get, if you're saved, the Holy Ghost will say, recalculating, I want to get you back. I'm not going to shut up until you get back on the road you're supposed to be on. And the last thing it'll do, it'll fight you. You believe I'm going down the road in a car, fighting my car. Because as I try to pull in, now look, if I turn my turn signal on, I can get into another lane and pass, my car don't give me a problem. But if I try getting in that lane without the turn signal, when I go like that, that steering wheel goes, uh-uh. 
I'll say, look, man, I'm just going to go over here for a little while. Uh-uh. And it'll shove me back in my lane. I can't get out of the lane unless I got a turn signal on. It'll fight me because its job is to keep me in the proper lane. You know what the Spirit of God will do to you? He could actually become your enemy. You get out of line with God, he'll fight you every step of the way. He'll bump on you. He'll sound the alarm. He'll recalculate. He'll tug on you every once in a while. If you're born again, you cannot live in sin and enjoy it. Because there's an automatic alarm been put in you when you got saved. And it's a driver of the Holy Ghost. And his intention is to keep you in the proper lane. Let's give the Lord a head clap of praise in his house today.